Sonic Super Special Issue 5 We start out with a story about Sonic, Sally, Rotor, and Antoine Tails all being friends as little kids. Which is even weirder to me than Sonic and Sally being friends as little kids. I liked the idea in the early comic where Sonic only knew Sally because she invited him to join the Freedom Fighters. If they didn't want me attached to that concept, they shouldn't have introduced it. It doesn't make any sense that Sonic would be childhood friends with a princess when he's not even remotely royal. What, what, does she go to the same school as him? Not to mention, Antoine is also rich, so why was he friends with him in childhood? So it starts me off on a sour note already, as I wonder if the story's even canon. Rosie, Sally's nanny, comes into the house and lectures the kids for roughhousing, with Sonic hitting Antoine for no real reason. At least it's not totally retcon that he used to bully him then, instead it's more that he used to do it when he was young and doesn't anymore. Jalela, despite being Sally's teacher, plays the cool mom and decides to let Sally hang out with her friends outside, implying that it's to teach her other lessons. Social lessons. That does make sense that you'd want to teach the future leader of the country how to socialize with and relate to people who aren't rich like her. As Sonic shows off with his speed by playing basketball all by himself, which I can understand, and reminds me of how he was playing ping pong by himself in the early Sonic comic, Tails is sad and insecure because he thinks he's never going to be as fast and cool as Sonic. I like the side of him, it's sympathetic. I also like how Sally calls him Miles, as if to imply that he's still awkward about having been born with a second tail, and doesn't want to take up a nickname that might as well be mutant. Sally then shows what a good friend she is by explaining with her hand on his shoulder that everyone has their talents. That she is great at school, Sonic's fast, Rotor, who in a nice touch is still nicknamed Boomer here, is a gadgetary genius even now, and in a moment of self-awareness of how useless he is by the writing, Sally can't really think of a real talent for Antoine, with her saying amusingly, and Antoine has, um, he's got, uh, an amazing French accent. Well, that is a talent, but not a useful one. I tell you what he's really talented at, pouts, because man, he couldn't get any less sympathetic looking. You know, I'm really starting to enjoy the story, what with all the references to the really early Sonic comic and old characterizations make them actually feel like they're younger and it's taking place in an earlier time, rather than just a stupid what-if scenario. Sonic then tells Tails as a compliment that he's unique, for obvious reasons, and I like how he says, hey, come on, being unhappy about it, with Sally scolding him, don't tease him, Sonic. I really like this, that there actually was a time when Tails was behaving realistically and was awkward about what made him special. Still don't have any confirmation that he was bullied for it though, which would have further justified his awkwardness. Then we immediately go back to Levity, as Tails figures out how to fly. Unfortunately, Tails himself is cheated out of making the discovery by himself like he should have, as the reason he learns how is because Sonic created a small tornado below him while telling Tails to spin his tails like helicopter blades, which got him flying. Sally shows that she's worried about him by immediately telling him nervously to calm down, even though being able to fly officially means he's not in danger when he's really high up anymore. Tails ends up flying uncontrollably towards the Great Forest because he doesn't know how to stop, and Sally scolds him, and they go after him. Rotor shows that he was a genius even back then by using an instrument for measuring altitudes of celestial bodies that he somehow has to locate where Tails should have landed. Although Tails didn't land there, as he's not here at the moment, so what happened there? Then a really tongue-in-cheek reference, Rotor says that he's got an idea to make a handheld computer called Nicole before being interrupted. I don't appreciate this one at all because it just distracts me and pulls me out of the story because I'm now wondering why, instead of Rotor having created Nicole a long time ago, they had to wait for her to show up out of a confusing, stable time loop from the future. Still fucking hate that origin for it, by the way. Will she ever get to enjoy the good future? Or will she always be perpetually sent back in time? Anyways, they find Tails in a hole in a stump that was a bit far from where Boomer thought that he would land. And I guess Antoine is known for being the one among them with the best hearing because it's him that Sally asked to tell everyone what Tails is saying. Why didn't Sally just say his talent was good hearing then? It wouldn't have been as funny, but still. Tails was saying that they should get away from the stump because the ground is unstable, and they all end up falling through it. I guess it's magical grass then. They fall into a limestone cavern that Rotor says is undiscovered. How do you know nobody else discovered it? Sally shows concern over Tails' well-being. 
And then Tails explains that when his tail stopped spinning so fast, he got a little flight control. But when he tried to land on the tree stump, it turned out to be hollow when he fell through it. Rotor says that the underground rock formation would make a great clubhouse, showing that he's got a lot of creativity and can easily come up with ideas for inventions and stuff. That I like about him. But again, all of his personality traits and talents are the ones he usurped from Tails. Tails should be an inventor and stuff. Sally says that the aquifer would be a better secret headquarters. So is this their first discovery of the Freedom Fighters base? That would explain why Uncle Chuck had a map there. I always thought it was only started to be used after Robotnik showed up. But this actually makes a lot more sense. That's how they all knew to come here so fast. Of course, it looks absolutely nothing like the cave they hidden in the early comics, which was brown instead of a grey limestone cave, though. To call themselves by a group name. Antoine's name is the best, though having the Fantastic Five there would mean them getting more than five people would end up being a little awkward. Rotor wants to name them Boomers Bombers. What? That sounds like a terrorist organization. Is he ditzy enough to not realize that? I guess everyone was just too polite to tell him it, even Antoine. Not to mention the first time I tried to say that, I said Bombers Boomers, so it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue well. Then Sally predictably is the one who comes up with the name Freedom Fighters. I like how Sonic says, That's a little extreme, don't you think? On the one hand, he has a point, but on the other, he didn't say that about Rotor's name, which even the evil counterparts game didn't choose. Then a promptly confused self held Sally saying that her father disappeared recently, which is why she chose the name. Why did he disappear? It's not like he was showing his own silence by this point, at least it doesn't seem like it. Sally then says that she's not allowed to tell her friends what she's learned exactly, but can only allude that she'll need their help. I guess she and Julayla think they'll all panic if they know it's gonna go down. Why does Tails bother correcting Antoine on his pronunciation? Did he just meet him? Anyways, their first mission of course is to get out of the cave, and Tails, now able to control his flight ability, flies out of the cave to send a vine down to help his friends climb out of it. And I assume this is one tough vine to not snap in two from Rotor's weight. It does make a little sense that having an actual purpose for his Tails gives Tails the confidence to happily want to call himself Tails. And of course, him making this decision from confidence certainly puts Miles into perspective. If he was really proud of having two Tails, why did he end up going by Miles again and finding offensive that it was called a name with the word Tails in it? What kind of stuff did he go through that even after he learned how useful his sales could be, he still couldn't like the nickname? Also, I noticed it earlier, but Tails, what is with those eyebrows? Then the next story has Sonic talking to a bunch of kids who admire him for fighting Robotnik, and he starts telling a story about how shoes like his can't be found anywhere else, and the closest to them are the ones he got for Tails. Naturally, since Tails can run fast too, although with Uncle Chuck's making Sonic's shoes so that his speed won't burn the soles off them, now I have to wonder why Scourge doesn't have that problem. He never had an Uncle Chuck, and he got new shoes later on. Anyway, Sonic telling a story to some kids is used as an actual framing device to make it justified a flashback to when they're all younger, which is the first story we really needed. We flash back to just a few years ago, where Tails was being tutored by Rosie, the royal tutor? Did Tails get adopted by Sally instead of Sonic? Well, at least he is being educated. And he got straight A's on his report card. I like that. It's a subtle, unintentional foreshadowing to him turning out to be a genius later on. Although I hate how Rotor says that when he took the test, he only got C's and D's. Really? A gadgeteer genius got nothing but bad grades? I know he's ditzy, but so is Tails at that point. Then Antoine shows up giving him an award as a gift, calling him Little One. That's pretty sweet. Then Antoine promptly ruins the moment by getting into a long, made-up story bragging about how brave he was getting the award. And Rotor interrupts him that it turns out Antoine's father saved the king from an elephant, while Antoine himself was sick that day. Tails then says that Sally's party is really neat. This is supposed to be a party? That's the lamest, quietest party ever! Well, I'd expect that of her. It'd be like a party thrown by Monica Geller. Table coasters everywhere, music down low. Sally, still calling him Miles, says that Sonic should be here any second now. Then it turns out that Sonic was actually making a deal with a cloaked figure in what looks like a factory or lab, dealing with the underground market to get merchandise. This seems pretty unusual of Sonic to do. I mean, what if what he was getting wasn't what he thought he would be? 
He trades him something for ordinary rocks while wondering what the deal was with him. And then Merlo thinks with a friendly smile that he got Tails a gift from his uncle. So he probably got the ordinary rocks so that he could make them magical. So now I have to wonder why the hell Merlin hasn't told anyone Tails is his nephew yet, and why he couldn't just be honest with Sonic. If anything, it'd be better for Tails to know he's a wizard because then he gets stronger and more capable. Because he'd learn how to do his powers. Not to mention, if Merlin's a wizard, why can't he just magic up some ordinary rocks? Then we cut to Robotnik and Snidely in a lab, with Robotnik saying that he knows the Freedom Fighters must be in the Great Forest. So, Sally and Tails were still being tutored by Rosie while they were being Freedom Fighters? I never heard anything about that. I saw Rosie, but I didn't see her tutoring. At least Robotnik lampshades how stupid he was to not even try to attack Sally while he had the chance. I like that Snively briefly calls him Uncle Jules out of habit. Then Robotnik makes another one of his magical, overpowered inventions that he can make for no reason. This one being especially egregious, as it can freeze a person in time. He built this, and he still didn't beat the Freedom Fighters. He deserved to lose. Granted, it's a matter of actually hitting something with the thing, and he still doesn't know where Nuthole actually is, so we have to find it first to be able to use it on his enemies at night while they're sleeping, the most ideal way to use the device. Snively shows that he's been playing against Eggman from the very beginning. It then turns out that Sonic really was affected, but not in the sense that he was left unable to move and easily to smash, instead it was more like when Fry and Futurama drank 100 cups of coffee. This kind of power should have allowed Sonic to completely destroy Eggman's base and take him out once and for all. Oh wait, never mind. Apparently, Eggman froze everyone in Not Hole except Sonic. How was that possible when Robotnik was only near Sonic? He would have had to be in there and thus discover it in order to shoot every single person in Not Hole including the people who must have been inside their homes at that point. Or is it that it's not all the villagers? The frozen time villagers get picked up by the robots, and actually chuckled out when Robotnik's break crosses the line twice. And make sure you get every single one of them. I don't want anyone to feel they got left out. They should have written feel like, but good enough. The sentence would have flowed more naturally with that. Then our robot shows free will by asking why Robotnik bothers treating them like that when he knows they're going to do the work anyways. And Snarly says that it's because he's the boss for now. Which should have immediately gotten him in trouble after the robot hurt him and routed him out. Because we've seen swap bots enjoy seeing other robots get punished for not being loyal enough. And it's not like Snively said for now really quietly. So this is a reference to Snively's later plans that I don't like because they should have just had him think it instead. Then Sonic, after leaving Tails' shoes and some leaves to hide it when he could have just dipped to the party at Sonic's speed and left it there, pretends he's frozen in time to let himself be taken away so that he can reverse the effects of the race and save the village. I love how Sonic acts so endearingly tricksterous Bugs Bunny where he surprises Eggman in his boasting, pulls on his mustache, and then presses all the buttons on the control panel while saying, So which button unfreezes everyone? Won't tell me? Oh well, gotta press them all! This is why I like Sonic. Because of this, the villagers all escape and Snively gets frozen for some reason. Odd, I didn't see Sonic shoot him. I like that after the time immobilizing Ray gets destroyed, Robotnik says it'll take years to build another, explaining why we never saw it before he got defeated. But he built this device way quicker than years. Maybe he meant that the materials he made it with are so rare and tedious to get that he's exhausted to supply them. And at the end, he gives Tails the shoes. He makes a fool out of himself by making a pun on time for Sally when she's obviously not going to get it. But see, this bad comedy is at least self-aware of how bad it is. Unlike in Colors, where Sonic is never portrayed as an idiot for making bad jokes at inappropriate times. And the story ends with the kids all having fallen asleep from the story. How did Sonic not notice this until now and keep on saying the story until it ended? That must have been pretty annoying. And yet he seems fine with it. I don't understand why they fell asleep, you'd think they would have been interested. The third story shows the Freedom Fighters wary and hurt, and Uncle Chuck warns them that whatever they had just encountered scrambled their risk communicator's transmission to the source. Sonic complains that apparently they had missed the remains of one of Eggman's combots when they cleaned up after the attack, and a text blurb explains that he means after the attack in issue 38 specifically, so that's when the story takes place. Well this is one way to write around Robotnik being gone, make stories take place before he was defeated that were never referenced by the earlier stories, and don't contradict the earlier stories, so it's fine. It does work rather well. 
Then Ichwan tells Chuck that the Combots must have a backup power generator that caused them to go back online. The energy signature that Chuck's inventions detected earlier coming from the woods was coming from Eggman's activated weapon of destruction, and Sonic wishes that he had known that before he came out to investigate. It turns out that when the three of them had gotten attacked, by sheer lucky coincidence, as in Creator's Pet moment, Sally, despite being Bruce herself, was the only one among Antoine and Sonic to be able to save the day, as the other two were knocked out cold. By the same thing that hurt her, I assume. So yeah, she was really lucky. Well, I'm glad to see her being useful. She taunts the robot, saying that, What's the matter? Shy around girls? Gets grabbed by the ankle by an excitable cord, and uses her laser shooting phaser to break off a boulder above her that's nice enough to tumble on the combat and not her, who is right below it while the combat was further away. That was also pretty lucky. Unfortunately, Antoine then wastes comic space and valuable time with some panels of him doing a make believe story of him actually being useful. And then Sonic does the exact same thing. I'm not describing much of this because I honestly don't know if this is canon or not, and I wouldn't put it past the writers to make Sally's scenario the only canon one for being the popular female role model character and all. All there is to say about it is that, ironically, Antoine's story was more believable than Sonic, even though Sonic has more experience with actually winning over robots, as Sonic's story has the robot blowing up and being pathetic for no reason. And this egomaniac was the guy who felt uncomfortable seeing a statue of himself. Then Uncle Chuck says that it's a good thing he programmed Nicole to uplink with his spy satellite, as Nicole had recorded the whole events of the evening from Mobius' orbit. Orbit? From that far away? How could the footage have been useful at all? She'd have to click the imaginary enhance button on it 30 times to get anything that's not blurry pixels. It's explained that Sonic had, like, had buzzed off the combot's legs and kicked dirt into its exposed circuitry. Antoine was attempting to use his sword to cut the circuitry, and Sally didn't want to risk her laser ricocheting off its middle hide, so she made it reflect off something else, which I can only assume is a mountain, and that defeated the robot. Well, while they could have saved us a lot of wasted time by not having made up stories at all, the story completely makes up for it by even having Sally lie at all. By showing that even her story was made up, that even the goody two-shoes perfectionist princess would glorify herself as the only hero, and in a more subtle way, suiting her intelligence rather than being an out-character moment, all this makes her go from having a creator's pet moment, to it being a false alarm as she is revealed to be not so above it all. I love those moments, we need more of them. Well, this is certainly a lot to summarize. The first story was by Mike Gallagher. I was expecting this whole issue to be a story about Snively and the criminals invading Mobotropolis, especially since there was a special and all. So at first I was disappointed at seeing a story about Sonic and his friends with Joker kids and was expecting it to be terrible. But then they started having references to the earliest issues that make it actually feel like this was a story taking place in the past, when they were that young, with Sonic punching Antoine just for fun because he was still bullying him at that time, rather than the bullying being retconned and swept under the rug, and Sonic playing a sport with himself to show off his super speed because he was doing that way more often early on. There was Rotor still going by the nickname of Boomer, although they didn't explain why he realized it was a terrible idea. And Tails showing some new depths by starting to insecure and awkward about his second tail like he'd be realistically, with Sally thinking Sonic was teasing him for on the drop of a hat until he learned how to fly and called himself Tails from seeing a newfound purpose as Tails. I really wish he was allowed to just learn to fly on his own though instead of Sonic getting half the credit. This story actually gives an origin to the Freedom Fighters face knot hole, and it makes more sense that they would all have been able to go to it right away for a base when Robotnik began wrecking havoc now that I know that they had this base as a place to play already. That might also explain why Uncle Chuck had his treasure map to Sonic's bronze baby shoes there. He actually knew where it was before it was roboticized, so this was a pleasant surprise. The second story was by Tom Rolston, and starts out with an actual framing device justifying with Earl Yoker, when the first story should have done it to make it more obvious that it's canon and not a stupid diversion. And it's a story about how Sonic got Tails his shoes. They really care enough to explain everything in this comic, and I can't believe people actually complain about that, because I absolutely love it. Shows passion. I also like how Sonic implies, based on how he explained his shoes were special, that Tails' shoes are also made to not burn off the soles from being ran too fast. I wonder if Sonic had Bass and Tails to learn to be able to actually run that fast that day. We have Robotnik around the story, which I actually found refreshing after the long, much-needed break from him. 
and he makes an overpowered time freezing device that fortunately gets destroyed for good with a good explanation for why I didn't just build another one and effortlessly win. It was pretty fun. Sonic was pretty lucky he was running fast at the time he was avoided getting hit with the time freezing lasers, but he was running, so it makes sense. And the third story was by Carl Bullers and took place in the aftermath of the combots being let off a cliff. Makes sense, they were described as invincible, so it makes sense that they wouldn't be destroyed by that. Most of it consisted of the characters wasting their time with fake what-if scenarios of what they did to beat the robot, ending off with Nicole having recorded the whole thing from all the way up in outer space somehow without the fight looking like a bird's eye view of some dots fighting some other dot with no one being able to tell what's going on. Bullshit powers activate. But what saved the story for me was the fact that even Sally's account of the story was a lie. It went from her seeming to have a creator's pet moment for defeating the robot single-handedly to her turning out to be not so above it all. And even though I like Sally, as she's nice and believably intelligent and competent, even I'm really happy to see her have moments like this where she gets humiliated and humbled, where she makes mistakes. Because I'm thinking her having not enough moments like this for the sake of avoiding accusations of sexism is what made people call her a Mary Sue in the first place. When really I think it's more like she's the typical, like, women are wiser, closer to Earth trope. That is actually a very, very common trope in media, so I'm surprised about how people make such a big deal out of it with Sally. So yeah, this issue was fantastic. It had nothing to do with anything, but it was still really fun. It also made me miss Eggman of all people, as I guess I gave credit to him being there for the stories being good, when the real reason they were good was that we got to see all the Freedom Fighters showing off the personalities and accomplishing important stuff by fighting a villain. I mean, you could have replaced Eggman with any villain, and the plot would have still been the same. You could have had a wizard accomplishing making those inventions. Consider that recently, we've only really seen Sonic, Sally, and Tails in the main comic, while the rest are all in the background. They made such a big deal out of Antron and Bunny getting together, and we hardly see them together at all. At least here, we had all of them doing stuff. Although I especially enjoyed Sally. For some reason, her characterization feels different, better, and more interesting than the main comic so far. Standing up for Tails being like a mother figure to him, for example. But again, this is a past situation, and she has more comics-based job personality here. It's not like with the story where most of it was Jeffrey training his elite and Sally barely got a chance to show up. I remember hearing the complaint that Sally got chickification after Robotnik was defeated, which is really put into perspective in this comic where she's back to trying to act tough and being all serious. And believe me, I don't like the chickification either. But all I've been seeing is her being more sympathetic recently, revealing her stress and having more moments of vulnerability. Like saying to Sonic that she didn't want to worry him with her dumb problems. I'd never have imagined her acting that way earlier. And her actually telling Sonic that he rules and she wants him to come back soon when he left to find Nix's Nogus. At the beginning of the comic, she was a tsundere about him and would have never been a softie by admitting that. But with Robotnik gone, it makes sense. She doesn't have to act tough because she's not dealing with Robotnik anymore. She's in peacetime now. And her getting a boyfriend and thus requiring her to be more open with her feelings and let people in probably opened the floodgates, hence the supposed chickification, because she's actually showing vulnerability now, telling Sonic that she likes him. She's still just as competent as before, she hasn't been shown to be incompetent, but she's not doing the fighting because she doesn't have to. And having a boyfriend is also making her more honest about her worries and stuff. I still like her, I like her more in this issue, but this character development isn't the end of the world, especially since it's only temporary anyways. But that's from a girl's perspective. Next up, we're returning to the main comic with issue 64 to 67. 